talk is a bit challenging because I'm taking my massive 700 page doctoral dissertation and I am condensing this into one hour. <laughs> it's probably not gonna go that well, but there's, there's a lot here to cover. But basically what I'm looking at is how the ancient Egyptian cult made millions of pots. And so we're gonna explore this topic through a combination of text, archeology, span and a bunch of looking at pots themselves. So without further ado, we'll jump in. Um, when we see ancient Egypt, we think of this. We think of pyramids, we think of a highly organized society, we think of a king who is very powerful, the pharaoh ruled everything, it was a highly organized society, top down, ruled everything, could make giant pyramids with big blocks of stone and stack them perfectly. And this is our image. But how much does this image actually reflect the reality of ancient Egypt? And this is something that archeologists and Egyptologists have been exploring for the last 20 years to try to move beyond this monumental architecture and get at what it was actually like to be in ancient Egypt. How did the state function? How did the administration function? What was the connection between regular people and the administration? And so there's so many ways of exploring this issue, but my talk deals with economy and temples. And even that's really broad, <laughs> so it even delves further into pottery. So looking at the economy and production is a great way to move beyond the facade of the grand monuments and to see what life was like for ancient people and for the administration. And particularly temples are ideal to explore this because the temples were an important arm of the ancient Egyptian state. They were there to facilitate the official cult of ancient Egypt and they were massive economic institutions on behalf of the state. But also under the umbrella of ritual and cult, there was a lot of private ritual activity in ancient Egypt. And so how people met their demand for all the goods that involved ritual is an important aspect to study and it can gain insight into regular people and the state. But in particular, I look at pottery. And why do I look at pottery to understand the economy? Well, that's because pottery was first and foremost used as storage containers. So every sort of liquid that was in the temple had to be contained in a pot at least at some juncture. It was also used to hold many, many different kinds of offerings. And pots, they were made by people of a lower social strata, but they were used by everybody. So from the highest temple priest to the lowest social rank, people used pots. So understanding how they were made and how they were used, you can get it everybody in society. And on top of that, pottery is found in just about every archeological context in ancient Egypt. Once you fire pottery, it's essentially indestructible unless you really smash it. Um, but even that, you have small pieces. So we have tons of pottery in the archeological record. So this is a great material to, to look at, to answer so many questions. And on top of that, it's been studied so much by archeologists in the past. So there's tons of methodologies and theories to learn about how you can use pottery to study and understand different facets of ancient society. So pottery is a great way to look at issues of economy and ritual. And what we have here are beer jars from ancient Egypt from the New Kingdom. So this is what a beer jar from the second intermediate period looks like. It's pretty similar than the New Kingdom. But you can see they're thrown on the wheel they're very rough, they're made super fast. These are economic vessels. They're made quickly to fill tons and tons and tons of jars of beer. They wanted to make a lot of these things. And just a side note before we continue, I don't know how many of you have looked at pottery drawings, but these can be a little bit confusing for people. So this is the inside of the pot, this is the profile, and that's the outside of the pot. So we're gonna see a lot of pottery drawings in this, in this talk. So this talk in particular looks at pottery production for cultic ritual at Abydos, this site in Middle Egypt. And this was the sacred site to the god Osiris. And we'll talk about him in a minute. But basically what I did is when I was starting my, my dissertation, I was working at Abydos as a ceramicist for a project there. And I saw all these beer jars and I thought, oh, these are fascinating. It's a great way for me to study the temple and temple economy. So for my dissertation, I ended up measuring pottery from two different cultic activities. One was the private festival for the god Osiris, this is the Osiris festival, and the other one is cultic activity that was connected with a chapel, 
of Tutmos III. This is a new kingdom king in an area called North Abydos. So I had these pots from the North Abydos votive zone is what we call it. And I looked at beer jars from the new kingdom. And then I looked at votive dishes from, well, well I asked to look at beer jars and votive dishes from the new kingdom from Umogab. And I was so lucky that the ceramicist, Yulia Budka at that project, she just started handing me trays of pots to measure and to work with. So I was very fortunate to have not only New Kingdom beer jars to compare with the North Abydos sample, but I also had New Kingdom small votive dishes and votive dishes from the Middle Kingdom all the way into the late period. So I had this great sample that covered a large period of time. So the Um al -Gab material is a private festival. North Abydos is probably connected with a temple cult. So what I did was, I had all these pots and I measured the rim diameter. And then I took the measurements of the rim diameters and I calculated statistics on them to understand how similar they are. So this is the metric variability that I talk about in this, in this presentation. So based on the metric variability, we can tell a lot about the organization of production. So the general principle is if the pots are super uniform, they all have the same rim diameter, then that means probably they're made by one big factory and they come from one production location by people making lots of pots because their hands have this mechanized production and they're very used to making standardized forms. But if the pots are variable, then it means several things. Either it's a small producer that doesn't make quite as many pots, so their hand isn't as skilled at making routine you know, shapes and, and sizes, or it can also mean that the pots come from many different workshops. So this is what, what we're working with, the idea here. So the goal is to understand temple economy and production and use the Abydos example as a case study to gain further insights. And why do we have to do this? It's because there's very little textual information from ancient Egypt about pottery production. There's very little textual information that details the specifics of the ancient economy. You get tiny little snapshots. So you have to combine all of this together to sort of get a big picture of what happened. So this is just one small case study. So we're gonna start with private ritual. And this is a very wonderful facet of ancient Egyptian society, at least according to me, is that ancient Egyptians loved things. They had a lot of stuff. And they had a lot of things that were connected to ritual activity and to their burial. So one of the major aspects of ancient Egyptian society is their own personal private ritual. These are non-state you know, non people engaging in ritual activities. So what we have here is commonly you have votive offerings like this stila so that the god Ta hears someone's prayers. Or what we have here at Umal Gab, this is the, the private ritual site for the god Osiris, we have mounds and mounds of pots. You see that? These are all pots. Way in the distance and way over here. A French archaeologist in the early 20th century estimated there's 15 million pots scattered around Omal Gob. That's a lot of pots. So how did people get all of these things? Now, one of our known things about ancient Egypt is that in the Greco-Roman period, we have a lot more text, we have a lot more information. So we know in the Greco-Roman period, there was a thriving market for offerings to give to the gods. So there was a votive market. And we know this from the text, but also from objects. We have millions of these Greco-Roman animal mummies that were given as offerings to various gods. And many of them, as it turns out with x-rays, were what people call fakes. I don't think it's maybe a nice way to call it a fake because they still left a votive offering, so it still had its ritual function. But if we look at this one, this is from the Manchester Museum. Inside, there is no cat. This is supposed to be the mummy of a cat. It's just stuffed with material. So people bought these animal mummies by the millions and they offered them to the various different gods. But we don't know if these practices extended farther back. We don't know if they were there in the New Kingdom and the Middle Kingdom. So part of what I'm curious about with looking at the pottery for the Osiris Festival, could something like this have happened? If you went to the Osiris Festival, would you have gone to a massive market and bought a bunch of things to leave as offerings? Did the same practice extend that far back? And that's one of the things I want to explore in this study. So then we have ancient Egyptian temples. And this is what we see of temples. This is Karnak Temple. We see 
a beautiful temple. You see massive high walls, stone, carvings, beautiful, beautiful stunning material. And this is what most people think of when they think of a temple. But in reality, temples in ancient Egypt were more this. This is the Ramesseum. This is Ramses II's mortuary temple in Luxor. And all these mud brick buildings are granaries. So this is a huge grain storage. And there would have been lots of production facilities, economic facilities, bakeries, breweries, flower arranging centers, tons of things at, at temples in ancient Egypt to provide the cult with what it needed to give daily offerings. But also temples were, as the great Egyptologist Barry Kemp called them, the reserve banks of their day. They held a vast amount of grain wealth, because there was no money at this time in ancient Egypt, and money was grain, so they stored a lot of wealth too. So they were these economic powerhouses that were connected to the state. And we know a little bit about how they functioned. Uh, we know quite a lot that there was a, a, a temple ritual where the king, in theory, now in theory the king gives all offerings to all temples in Egypt, but in reality it was the priesthood that did this. So you would have the, the high priest or the king, the, the, the priesthood, offering tons of goods to the gods. So there was daily temple ritual, which consisted of a full meal for the gods several times a day, and it, also the gods needed clothes, so the statue of the god was the focal point of the temple ritual. And the statue would be back there, dressed in full garments, everything, wearing all the stuff, and the priest would have to go in, change the clothes of the god several times a day, anoint the statue with oil, and leave a lot of food offerings, flowers, many different things, and burn a lot of incense. They also had festivals, and these festivals were occasions where extra offerings were given, where people could come and have some kind of interaction with the god. So festival occasions were very, very important for people on a personal level in terms of their piety and their connection with the god, but they were also important economically because of this extra offering. Now what happened with all these offerings? Well, the idea behind ancient Egyptian offering practices was kind of smart. So you leave the offering for the god, the god consumes the spirit of the offering, and then those offerings are reverted back to the priesthood or the general population for big feast days or big festivals. So all the food that was given to the gods as an offering was generally consumed uh, and used by people. So it kind of re-entered the economy in a way. So this makes it even more of an economic uh, powerhouse. So we also have a few texts here and there that gives us an understanding about offerings uh, given to various different temples. So one of these is the Great Harris Papyrus, written in the reign of Ramses IV, but covering events of the previous reign of Ramses III. So it talks about all this stuff he donated to various temples. Now this probably isn't his regular temple offering. This is like donations maybe on top of what he did. There's a lot of debate going on around this. But just in terms of land, he donated 30,000 hectares of land to the temples. And this land could be used to grow produce. And also, by the way, this is an incredible papyrus. It's the longest papyrus from ancient Egypt. It really has like tons. It has just vast quantities of goods. And some of my favorites from this are over 10 million bouquets of flowers to the gods, because they liked flowers every single day, and many of them. You had Nile fish, you had sandals, you had cuts of beef, jars of wine, jars of beer, lots of different things. So this gives us just a snapshot of the kind of economy we're talking about here. And we, I mean, we would love to have more information from, from other different kings, but it points to a big economic endeavor. We also have, and this relates to what happens at Abydos, we have incense offerings. And this is the study of the first temple at Abydos. We have two different ways you can see that the king is offering incense. This is like in a golden cup, and this is in a, a metal incense burner. Incense was vital for Egyptian religion. It started most ritual activities. Incense was the air that the gods breathed. One of the words for incense is sin nature, or to make divine. It was an important component of temple ritual, and people used it in their private ritual too. So this is regular, regular activity for rituals, either burning incense or having some incense resin. This is a, an offering that the gods really wanted, and regular people and priests needed this for their rituals. And we have a lot of variation with incense burners. We have 
kind of, what I love so much about ancient Egyptian art is you have like an image like this and then you can have a real <laughs> object that kind of looks like it. So this is a, a more fancy incense burner that probably would have belonged to the temple and was used regularly in actual temple, you know, burning practices. But then private chapels, smaller chapels and regular people when they had religious activities, they would use something more like this. This is a pottery incense burner and it's got this kind of white gypsum on it. So some people think that this white gypsum was used to even add like a luminosity to make it even more sacred. And we can see some of the resin here from, from burning inside. So this is kind of the lower cost version. And this is what I was looking at in Abydos, something like these. So these are the New Kingdom incense burners that I talk about later on. I'll show you drawings of them too. But we also have votive dishes. So these are small little guys, little tiny, like this is a 10 centimeter scale, it's a five centimeter scale. They're little tiny pots. And as you can see, they're a little bit, like these guys are a little bit wonky. They're made on the wheel very fast to produce tons of them. And they would have had some kind of offering inside, most likely incense or resin, but archeologists at Umagav have found a ton of other kind of offerings that would have been placed inside of them. And they were offered to the gods. And these, along with lots of other kinds of pots, make up those mounds of pottery at the site. And it's part of that 15 million maybe pots that are there. So they're usually small dishes. I call them votive dishes in this presentation and in my study because they had a votive function. Now these kinds of pots, these two have been found at archeological sites and other contexts where they're used for different things. But when it's clearly in a temple context like Umal Gob, what was happening at Umal Gob was a, a ritual practice. It was votive, it wasn't a house. It wasn't used for other things. And these guys are super famous. These are the kind of type, like the, the, the typical late period uh, offering dishes that you would have at Umal Gob. And they're called gobbies sometimes and they're often the, the, the type that the site is even named after. So these are, these are found in abundance at uh, Umal Gob. So these would have not been used by priests and temple rituals, but they would have been more commonly used by, by regular people making quick offerings. Beer offerings. Okay, so beer was very important in ancient Egypt. It was a source of calories, and it was also, you know, made out of grain, and grain was, as I said earlier, the main, the main currency of, of ancient Egypt. So beer was an important, almost, commodity uh, at that time. But it was also something that the gods liked. Humans liked it, and gods liked it. So the gods needed a lot of beer offerings every single day in the temple. And if people were making offerings to either ancestor deities or they were making offerings to the gods, they would also pour out libations of beer. So this was something that everybody needed for all their kind of ritual practices, but people also needed an abundance in their daily life too. And this here, I love these because most stela that you look at or most art from ancient Egypt, you have these little things underneath trays of offerings. So you have heaps of offerings over here. You have a priest, this is a funerary image, so this is not temple ritual, it's funerary, but the idea still conveys. You have a priest offering incense with the same burner we've seen, and down here are rows of beer jars. We have tons of them. These have a, a ceiling on top, like a mud stopper, and you find it in most um, offering scenes in ancient Egypt, so beer was there for everything, uh, both in state and private cult. These are two examples of beer jars. Uh, these are from Um al Gab, and these are kind of intact beer jars. And these are only the rims that we found in North Abydos. It was an active excavation. It's very different archeological context. So Umal Gab, the whole pot is preserved because people leave it as an offering. Whereas in North Abydos, it's an active temple, so they dispose of the pots after they're used and they break. So these are kind of examples of this pottery form. And as you can see there, as we saw earlier, they are made on the wheel very fast and they're both Votive dishes and beer jars are made out of a, a Nile silt. They're made out of the, the, the remains of the flood of the Nile that people added extra material like some straw and some sand a little bit to make it more workable. And the potters use this Nile silt to make these, these forms. So we have a lot of beer jars at temples uh, in, in vast quantities. And so this has led people to, to ask, well, how, how, many, how many beer jars would have needed to be used at temple rituals? How much beer was used? Well, there's some great 
information uh, from this festival calendar. There's several festival calendars from the New Kingdom, but this one at Medinet Habu, this is the Mortuary Temple of Ramses III, so the same guy from the Great Harris Papyrus. They um, provide a lot of information about offerings used in temple ritual. Now there's like specialized offering formula in ancient Egypt where you'll see a thousand bread, a thousand beer, a thousand this, a thousand that, may Osiris, you know, grant me something in the afterlife. It's, it's, it's a formula. These things, these festival calendars, they were not formulas. They were very specific. They had the exact, you know, uh, ritual, the, the which part of the ritual, and they had the exact festivals, and they had the exact quantities, the exact type of beer jars, amongst other things, to be offered to the gods. So what I did in, in my study is I went through the entire festival calendar, and I calculated how many of different types beer jars were used or were listed in this festival calendar to be used for ritual. So what I found is that, okay, so these are the ancient Egyptian names of the type of jars. Uh, so the total number of daily offerings for beer jars was 221, and the total number of beer jars offered monthly for festivals is 307. Now there were different kinds of festivals, so again, these are, these are approximate you know, numbers, we can't run away with it and say there was exactly 307, but it kind of gives you an idea. And then when we calculate everything, per year, it gets to around 87,000 beer jars that were used per year in the festival, in the temple cult at Medinet Habu. And when you take it for the entire reign of Ramses III, which of course, you know, when did he start offering? It was probably not day one of his reign. Uh, it was probably somewhere in the middle. When you calculate it further, so I have a whole big old thing, it's around, for, for his entire reign, if indeed, it gives you an approximate number, that would be around 2.6 million pots, 2.7 million beer jars, in theory, for, for his reign. Now there's a lot of confusion around this number. Does, is it actually this, this number? Does it mean 2.7 million individual beer jars, or there, was there some reuse in this? How did it work? but it's there to illustrate the quantity that was needed for these rituals. So there could be reuse, it doesn't mean it's exactly the same exact number, but it's just there to show you scale. So how did the temples and regular people get their offerings? Um, so pottery can, can inform on this issue. So we don't know, is it small scale production for the private cult, just because people are doing private ritual without the, the help of the state? Was it smaller scale production to meet their needs? And then for the temple, was it this large scale production where you would have massive sort of factories almost, providing all the materials for people? We had these questions. Uh, and so what I did was I decided to look at the pots themselves. But before that, before I turned to the pottery, I first looked at pottery production sites in Egypt. And I looked at every known pottery production site that's it's here on this map from the Middle Kingdom and the New Kingdom to try to understand different trends about pottery production. And there's some curious features. First and foremost, um, in most pottery production sites, there's rarely more than two kilns in operation at a given time, so at most workshops. Maybe on a plan you might see that there's four kilns, but if you look at the levels, only two are operating, or three, or you know, mostly around two. Most kilns in ancient Egypt are you know, between one and 1.5 meters in diameter. Um, which is you know around three to five feet, so they're you know they're they're not super big, but they're medium size I guess in the world of kilns. So it seems like there's not that many massive production facilities. Now I think when we think about pottery production, and we think that you need a ton of kilns to make a lot of pots, but not really. So one or two kilns can still make a fairly large amount of pots per year. It can make probably fifty thousand, something like this, sixty thousand. It can do quite a lot but not that 2.7 million that you would expect, or even a million if we cut it in half. Um, so it leaves us with more questions and answers. And I don't want to make too much of a big deal about the pottery production evidence because it's very hard to argue something from negative evidence. Just because we don't have it doesn't mean it didn't exist. And particularly when it comes to temples, if those places have modern construction on them now, and archaeologists in the 19th and 20th century, when they started excavating temples, they were really interested in uncovering the temple, 
finding statues, finding all the beautiful things, and so they didn't pay attention to the outside areas that much. So maybe there was stuff that didn't get found, who knows. So it gives us a clue that perhaps there is maybe not the kind of large workshops that we would expect. So we have another interesting feature, and these are a few texts that we have from two sites that are state-operated sites, and these are places where workmen and their families lived who worked on state projects. So one is called Cahun in the Middle Kingdom, in the Fayum, and the other one is the famous Daryl Medina uh, near the Valley of the Kings, and these are the village of the people who built the tombs in the Valley of the Kings. Now, these people were busy working for the pharaoh full time. They didn't have time to do quite all the things that normal people would do in ancient Egypt. And they don't seem, they don't seem to have been out there getting pots for themselves. So we have delivery receipts of potters who brought pots to the administration that were then given out to the individual workmen. So the pottery receipt deliveries show that they had a whole bunch of potters in the area that would deliver a quota, and it was a set quota, of different types of pots. They would deliver it to the administration. And this was part of their baku. Now the word baku is, is complicated in ancient Egyptian and there's tons of different meanings for it. But in this case, Baku worked as sort of a labor tax on potters so that the state could meet its demand for pottery but without actually having to front the capital of having big pottery workshops. So it, it, it worked to meet the needs of the various, um, the various people living in these, these communities of workmen. But did that, could that have actually functioned at a temple? We don't really know. So with this, I decided to actually look at the pots. Well, first of all, I was working in Abydos anyways, and so that's why I started looking at the pottery there. And one another problem we have at Abydos is we don't have any pottery production sites from these time periods. So we have no workshops making pots, so that's not helpful. So the only thing I could do was look at the pots themselves. And that's where I did the metric analysis, where I grouped pots that were similar together. I tried to group pots from similar archeological context, and we'll see this in a second and then I measured them. So these are the beer jars that I looked at from Omogab. And I was very fortunate that the ceramicist Yulia Budka had looked at these and she pulled out some that are roughly similar. And then I looked at the Middle Kingdom votive dishes, the New Kingdom votive dishes, and the New Kingdom incense burners, and several other late period forms. And then the, um, I looked at several types of beer jars from North of Idos. Okay. So first of all, to understand Abydos, you need to understand why is this one of the most sacred sites in ancient Egypt? Why is there so much ritual happening here? Well, this site was sacred to the god Osiris. This is the god of the underworld. Uh, he is so important for ancient Egyptians, both regular people and for the king, because he's the only god that died and went and was reborn again in the afterlife. So he's a model for what every ancient Egyptian wanted to have once they passed. They wanted to be like Osiris and have a successful regeneration into the afterlife. So there was a huge cult centered on this god. And the king was very much interested in this cult. And there was a huge state presence in Abydos. And regular people also wanted to have their own personal connection to the god. And so this is what we see as uh, Abydos. It's almost the entire site is, I'm not using a cheesy term, but it's like a votive landscape. Basically, everything that we know of at Abydos is temples, small private chapels, pilgrimage sites, and tombs is, is what we have. So it's, it's dense with, um, with material for, for the cult of the god Osiris. So I looked at two sites. So this is, this is the area called the North Abydos Votive Zone over here. And this is where my professor, uh, during my PhD, Marianne Pools Wagner, was working with the North Abydos Votive Zone, University of Toronto. And then Umalgab is over here. And this is where the German Archaeological Institute is working. Now at Umalgab you have two things. First of all, all these little guys, doo -doo -doo, those, are, those are tombs of the first pharaohs of Egypt. They were over here. And then at some juncture later on, definitely by the Middle Kingdom, but potentially in the Old Kingdom, ancient Egyptians connected the tomb of one of these pharaohs with the tomb of the god Osiris, and it became a major focal point for pilgrimage. So you have the two, two parts of the site. 
So the German Archaeological Institute, they're working at these tombs, at the pre-dynastic tombs and the, the early dynastic period tombs to excavate them. And then there's another project run by Ute and Andreas Efland uh, that tries to understand the popular festival to Osiris at the site as well, because there's two, two different things. And Yulia Budka is a ceramicist, and they were very kind to let me measure pots and look at pots for, for this study, and so I'm, I'm greatly appreciative for them for that. So this big thing here is the Osiris Temple enclosure. So the town would have been here, and the Nile is underneath here, and you have the ancient town, and this is the big, big temple, and inside this temple enclosure were tons and tons and tons of little temples uh, that different kings would put up for Osiris, and they're all in this area. And then there's a big temple here by Ramses II that leads out on this processional way going up to Um al -Gab. So I looked at, at material from over here. There's a chapel of Tutmos III that's right next to, very close to the Osiris Temple enclosure wall. And that's where my professor was excavating. Um, so this is, this is the area that, that I was focused on and also Um al -Gab. So this is the north of Vidos area. So in the middle, in the New Kingdom, this wouldn't have been as visible. Uh, oh, the Middle Kingdom, okay, so sorry. This is the portal temple of Ramses II, and this is the Tutmos III chapel. And then I looked at pots from over here. So there's like a roadway, and this is like, we, there's some evidence of like food production and things happening over here. So this is a service area for this chapel that was somehow in relationship in some way to the Osiris Temple enclosure. It's a little bit complicated, but... This is the kind of area. So the pots from here reflect a smaller state cult. It's nowhere near the, the Medinet Habu uh, festival calendar that we saw uh, at, 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 in Thebes for Ramses III, but it gives us a clue as to maybe how the state would have structured itself even at smaller chapels. We also now have Um al -Gab. So leading from the Ramses portal, this is the Tutmos III, this is the Ramses II portal temple. They would have left from here gone through this profession, the processional valley, stopped at Heku Reshu Hill, keep this in mind because this is where some of the pots come from, and that was one part of the, of the offering ritual, and they would have gone on to Um al -Gab, here where the supposed tomb of Osiris was and the, the, the focal point of the Osiris festival, where people would really leave tons and tons of offerings. And this is a very long festival, and there were huge processions of people coming with their offerings for the gods. And this is that famous photo of, of all the different heaps of, of pots everywhere. And the archaeological context for these pots is a bit interesting because people would go every year, deposit tons of pots, and then the priests would have to kind of, people would clean it up a little bit because you'd have to keep going to the festival. So the archaeological context is not like a normal excavation where you go down there's level by level by level, but it's like people gathered pots, disposed of them, moved them again, and kept moving stuff around. So the archaeological context is a bit complicated for the Um al -Gab material. Specifically, also, I had pots from really around the tomb of Jer. And the tomb of Jer was, was where a statue of Osiris was found, and this was supposedly the focal point of the festival of Osiris. So I had pots from around here and B40, B50, this, this area over here. So we've got no pottery workshops. We've got no text. What do we do? All right, so first of all, I looked at the variability in pottery, and I looked at variability in all kinds of ways. So I looked at it in terms of the forming technology. Were there different techniques used to make different parts of the pots? Because presumably, if you're a potter, and your workshop, they make pots in one way. So you're throwing pots, this is the standard way you do it, but if you have a lot of variability in the way that people are making them, then that's kind of a clue that there could be differences here. I looked at variability in fabric, and fabric is clay plus whatever else the potter put in it to make the, the clay more workable, or to have whatever kind of property the potter wanted. So I looked at both of those things, and importantly, I looked at the metric variability. So I, I talked to you guys earlier that metric variability, the idea is that if it's homogenous, it's probably one production facility or a large facility. If it's variable or heterogeneous, probably lots of different workshops or small-scale production. So here's what I did. I measured all the rims of all those pots, and then I put them into an Excel chart, and then I calculated what we call the coefficient of variation. This is how we measure it. This is the statistics that we use. This is a, this is a basic statistic, and we times it by 100 to get a percentage. So a low coefficient of variation means it's in incredibly uniform. A high coefficient of variation means there's a whole lot of variation happening. 
So low numbers means probably very organized central production, high number, pottery production's all over the place. And then, so this is the descriptive statistic that I used. So these are our beer jar samples, just so you get a look at it. I had one sample that was a whole mouth kind, where it goes in like that, and then another little collared rim type. Now samples were a problem because I was trying to pay attention and I had to get pots that were basically of the same type. So this means that my sample sizes were relatively small. So my sample sizes were 17 for type two and 14 for the whole mouth type. And then these I saw a whole lot of variability in fabric. There's three different fabrics used to make these pots. There was also a lot of variability in bases. They were broken, but I looked at the bases too, and the bases were made in a whole bunch of different ways, like completely different forming techniques. It was kind of strange. So also when we look at Ulmogob, these ones are from several different contexts. So they're from the tomb of Jair and from Hekoreshu Hill, a total of 19 samples. Also, there's several different of the Yulia Budka ceramics types put in. And I liked this because this is, okay, so this is the Meredith Brand approach to statistics and archeology. span It's kind of complicated with archeology span and statistics, but if you have one sample that's an ideal sample, where all pots come from one archeological context and it's brilliant and it's perfect, and you have another sample where pots are coming from a little bit of all over the place, then it's a problem to compare them. But if both samples are wonky in similar ways, then you can compare them. This is kind of my <laughs> rationality for this. So I was super happy that I got a tray of pottery from different archeological contexts because they both, now the North Abydos and the Umaga beer jars are from similarly kind of wonky contexts. So that's great. That means I can compare them both. But interestingly, despite the wonky context, these pots were incredibly homogeneous in terms of their fabric. It's all the same fabric type. And they had a generally similar manufacturing technique. And they're also both from the same time period, the North Abydos and the Umagab. Okay, so the votive dishes. We have Middle Kingdom and New Kingdom. So I have smaller, these are similarly different contexts around Umagab. And even if you have it from one context, it's kind of difficult with the archeological way it's done. But there were not many Middle Kingdom votive dishes at the site, but I collected some, I looked at some. So there's 14, 20 in that sample, 24 votive dishes, also importantly from many different contexts. And there's New Kingdom incense burners. Unfortunately, I only had seven uh, in that sample. So in the New Kingdom, there's a lot of pots from Umagab. So the, the two time periods we see the most our new kingdom and third intermediate period, late period. These are when you have a lot of pots. So this is the third intermediate period votive dish and this is the very famous late period one. Now the third intermediate period votive dish are from different offering piles around the tomb of Jair. There's 18 of those and 21 of these. And these gobbies are an outlier. All this entire sample is from one deposit. So it is from a much more ideal context than the other one. So that's important to keep in mind too. It's a little bit complicated, but it'll come out. All right, so those are the samples. Oh, and these are also uh, the, the votive dishes, these gobs down here were incredibly homogenous in terms of pottery, form, like pottery fabric and technology. And these had some differences, these certain immediate period ones. Okay, so now some audience participation. What do you think the results would be here? Do you think that the pottery for the state associated cult would be more homogenous, given that you think that it's, it's the pharaoh, it's the, the proper temple cult, do you think that the state would make more uniform pots? Or do you think private ritual would have more uniform pots? So the actual result is this. I will explain how this works. Okay, so these are the North Abydos beer jars. These are around 12%. These are the Umalgab beer jar. This is around 8%. Middle Kingdom votive dish, 8%. New Kingdom votive dish, so remember all of these are from wonky archeological context, okay? This is around 6%. The New Kingdom burners are 6%, but there was such a small sample. Third intermediate period and the gobs are also in this lower range. Now, what I did is I worked with st the, stat the statistics department at University of Toronto for a long time, and we found a way to do confidence intervals with this kind of coefficient of variation. 
So this is how significance testing works with this. It's super easy and very visual. So the idea is that if you repeated this experiment over and over and again, 19 times out of 20, these are the possible ranges of coefficient of variations you could get if you did this over and over again. So the idea is that if there's an overlap between this and this, there's no statistical difference between them. I mean, there is a difference, but it's not significant. But if there's no overlap, then this is huge, then that means that there is something really solid there, and there is a difference in, 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 in the way this, the, the numbers. The numbers are indeed different, and it's meaningful. So what we see is we do not see an overlap between the, the, the pottery in North Abydos and the New Kingdom votive dish. These are the same time period, both from wonky context, where you have lots of different you know, groups together, and there is a significant difference between these two numbers, these two metric variabilities. We don't see it so much between the beer jars at Omalgab and the beer jars at North Abydos. They are more metrically uniform, but it's so it's, you know, we have to be a little careful when we interpret that. But this is, this is quite something, to have the votive dishes and the beer jars be so different. Also, interestingly, this around 5 6% down here, this is, this is some of the most metrically uniform pots ever measured. Roman pottery is like 3 5 6 7 8%. Islamic pottery, similar things. This is some of the earliest pottery that's been measured, and it is for this material, and to have such an incredible incredibly low coefficient of variation is remarkable. These umalgab pots are very metrically uniform. If you look at them with your eyes, they look wonky. They are made quick on the wheel, they're made very fast, and they are uneven. But those potters who made them, they knew what they were doing. Their hands were so connected to this process, they've made so many of them that they can just make the exact same rim diameter over and over and over again. And we know about this because there's been a lot of ethnographic work measuring modern potters that make pottery by hand to get a sense of the kind of numbers that we're talking about here. So the pottery at Umalgab is incredibly metrically uniform. The pottery in North Abydos is a little bit less so. So this brings us to the end where we have some sort of conclusions from this study that are tentative, but pretty solid at the same time. So it suggests, so based on the variability of beer jar fabric and technology and the variability in the metrics, that the North Abydos, Tutmos III Chapel, they got their pots probably from different potters. It was probably not from the same workshop, it was probably from different producers. Omogab, on the other hand, for their beer jars was from a more limited production. So they had fewer producers and those producers probably made more pots. So it suggests that they had a larger scale of production it also suggests that these are two different lines of production for the North Abydos pottery versus the Umalgab pottery. Two different sources of pots for this material, even though it's the same type of pot. Also, with the New Kingdom pots, we see in the late period pots, the votive pottery, maybe it was only made from very few workshops, and given the homogeneity and how it's almost the exact same number as later Roman and Islamic pottery, where we know they're made in massive factories, Maybe these were made in a larger factory, but it's certainly from a fewer number of pottery workshops. And it suggests, again, that there is something different happening for the private votive dishes at Omalgab versus the temple and the beer jars. So there's another interesting one that I, that I noticed with this. In the period of time in which pottery was more common at Omalgab, when more and more people went to the actual festival, this is when the pots were the most metrically uniform. So this becomes very interesting because it shows, perhaps, that the potters and the, the workshops were responding to kind of laws of economics. They were intensifying production when there was a high demand, which is also very interesting when it comes to, to the economic organization, and it further perhaps points to a workshop-style production, a large manufactory versus smaller-scale production. And this is incredibly important because we don't really have evidence for this in the archaeology yet. So it shows that there might be something that we haven't seen. OK, so how does this all link to the ancient Egyptian economy? Well, first and foremost, we've got our pottery production in, in the New Kingdom, Egypt, and the Middle Kingdom seems dispersed all over the place in small scale. So that's kind of something that we have to reflect and say, hey, maybe we need to be looking for more pottery production sites because we don't have enough information there. And it's something that we need to hunt for. 
Also, it shows that temples and other institutions, they probably also use the same Baku network that the potters who supplied state work projects used. So maybe there's also a delivery quota for, for, for temples. So instead of temples actually controlling an entire manufacturing system, maybe they pulled a ton of potters together and they made them, that was part of their tax, is that they owed a work quota to the state. So it was perhaps more effort for the ancient Egyptian state to run massive factories and it was more beneficial for them on potentially social levels or economic levels to have a big network all around the community of potters that owed them work. And that's maybe how they got their pots and maybe how they were able to get so much material in ancient Egypt because making two million of something is a lot of work. Doing 10 million bouquets of flowers is a lot of work to do right there at the temple. But if you have a bunch of different people coming together and they owe you those flowers and you just keep track of it, that might have been more manageable for the ancient Egyptian state and it was a way to keep social patronage networks between the state and all the various people in the surrounding areas. So maybe that's how it could work, but it shows us that there's more to this temple production than just having a massive factory. Um, also what we see is that maybe there was a large scale, huge production and marketplace for private ritual that we see in the Greco-Roman period with things like mummies, but we haven't noticed for earlier times, maybe that existed earlier than we thought at things like like massive festivals like the Osiris Festival at Abydos. So it suggests that there is a possibility of that happening. So basically, it shows us that the, the ancient Egyptian, we need to think a little bit more flexible about the ancient Egyptian administration. The administration wasn't this massive monolithic entity that was completely top down like the pyramids that we see. It was probably dealing with social networks of people. It was probably more cooperative and flexible than we might originally think. So it goes to show that there's a lot we still don't know and these pots point to bigger questions out there. So it's, it's quite exciting. All right, so thank you so much. All right, do we have time for questions? I mean, my students, you have 15 more minutes, so you can ask me questions. Yes, Ruth. Yeah, I mean, they're all over Omogab. Well, because it's there, people always knew about it. So the Arabic name for the site, Omogab, is mother of gobs. Gobs is that kind of the, the late period small pot. So it's, it's called the mother of, of pots, the site, because everybody has always known that there's just mountains and mountains of pots here. So it was, it was there for, forever. And so this is why, you know, it's only recently that there's been this German Archaeological Institute project to seriously study the remains. Various archaeologists since the, the late 1800s have been to this area looking and, and excavating and finding very interesting artifacts. But the actual events of this festival you know, are known from various textual inscriptions, but the material culture evidence there at Umal Gob, it's being studied right now, and it's, it's, it's changing what we know of the, the practices that are happening there. So it's kind of, it's, it's, it's important work, and it's very exciting. Yeah, any other questions? Yes, Dr. Liska. Mm -hmm. Because you have the potters who make mm -hmm. the pots, mm -hmm. and you have the breweries mm -hmm. making the mm -hmm. beer, but then you also describe the pots going straight to the temple. So when, when did they get yeah. that? So, okay, so we do have some temples. Their breweries are, well, their bakeries are preserved. So, first of all, we have our bigger problem, which is we don't really know where the breweries are in, in ancient Egyptian uh, times. We have pre-dynastic, so early, early period. We have breweries that have been excavated. We know where those are. We don't know where the breweries are for the temples. We know where the bakeries are. There's been tons and tons of bakeries found. And the bakeries are very interesting. They're, they're smaller in size. They're modular. So we have the site of Tel El Amarna in the New Kingdom where there's the Great Aten Temple. And the next to it is a massive baking facility. But there's like tiny little rows of one room 
bakery areas with one small box oven, and then people would just bake the breads in these like modular sets. But we don't have any breweries attached to this facility. So at some point, somewhere, people were brewing beer, and we don't actually know, but we don't have any archeological evidence of it being in the temple, but it must be somewhere nearby if they're getting this much beer to the temple. So at some point, these pots came to a brewery facility. Whether that's next to the temple, in the temple, we don't know exactly. And then those pots that were filled with beer were then brought into the temple and used as the offering. So there's, there's a lot of missing links in that system. So without the brewery, maybe these pots can help address some of that mysterious missing question as well. So it's, it's kind of a, there's a lot, of, a lot of gaps here and that's why you have to turn to measuring pots because <laughs> there's not quite enough information that there needs to be. So that's a really good question. Yes. Yeah, it was their labor tax. So, so that's what, Baku was a work quota. So what they got was not being beaten. <laughs> that was, they, they got not in trouble. Yeah, I mean, so that was what they got. So I mean, as part, you know, people pay taxes and that's how it worked in ancient Egypt. Ancient Egypt, people, you either paid a certain quantity in grain if you were a farmer, or you had a labor tax if you were like, a, there was like a corvée labor system. And if you were a potter, in this case, you would make pots as part of your tax and you would owe a portion of pots, apparently according to the text from the very few sites, you would owe it to the administration and they would say, we want these many pots, so just make it for us. So that would be part of your income, would, would go back to the state. So it was a way that they were able to meet the need for tons and tons of things um, through a tax system. Yes? Uh, it just makes sense to me that that would be the only way that you could mm -hmm. Yeah. Well, yeah. This is another really good question. So there is some adjectives used to describe the pots in the delivery receipts. Well, they'll say this is a doubly good pot. This is a middling good. This is good. You know, so they, they do have kind of a few adjectives that they'll pepper in and you see them occasionally in delivery receipts. So there was kind of a sense of whatever good meant, we don't really know, but, but there were some pots that were better than others. Some pots that are made by very small, you know, uh, uh, small scale production in, in places like the American Southwest, things like this, where potters um, are focused more on the decoration and not the actual shape of the pot. And those, those pots will have coefficient of variations of 20, 30 percent, something like that. So this is still, you know, on the, the more uniform end, but it is less uniform. I mean, this is when it becomes difficult with metric variability, you have to compare things. Like, you have to have two sets of assemblages to compare, because what does 11 percent mean? Nothing. But 11 percent compared to 8 percent, okay, well, this is more homogenous than this. So that's what we're looking at, is that it is less, so what's happening at North Abydos is less homogenous than other places. But that variability of fabrics has been found at lots of other sites, where temples, their beer jars are made out of, you know, different types of fabrics. And they have different sizes too. So it seems that this practice at Abydos is comparable to other temple sites. Now, you know, how we, we go further with this. I mean, my kind of working, and this is, I need a lot more research to sort this out, but my kind of theory is that the, the way this worked is that we, so Egyptologists are now really focusing on patronage networks and these kind of local elites uh, that are not common in the, the textual records, but these were kind of important people in villages that were important because they were the middlemen between the state and the regular person. And so maybe these middlemen were the ones that were collecting things, moving things. Because if you're moving pots, you have to have donkeys to drag them around. You have to feed those donkeys. You have to do all these things. And some of that, those issues are recorded in delivery receipts. So it was a bigger ordeal moving those pots around. It involved a lot of individuals. But everybody was working <laughs> in some capacity for the state and not in the most logical, straightforward, make a big, massive factory kind of way. So I think it's, it's very important to show that when it came to the ancient Egyptian state, they didn't do things 
in our Western concept of rationality and efficiency. They had other considerations that were maybe more social that they were thinking about. Yes. Okay. Yes. I mean, I'm, I'm here until whenever. So I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about the use. Because yeah. in temple context, and then also uh, in active tomb uh, votive offerings where it's in the superstructure, those things are brought in, they're left there for a little bit, and then somebody comes, takes them away, then you know they act as salary, and they go back to the person's house, yeah. and assume that the priest like takes it home with him, and that's what he gets for you know, his yeah. salary. So then that means that the pot has gone from the state delivery through a ritual process, but then into a salary of an individual mm -hmm. person's house. Mm -hmm. And there should be, in some capacity, if he didn't break the pot along the way, a means of him filling it back up again um, and putting it back, like recycling yeah. it into the beginning of the session. Um, so part one of the question is, can you comment on yeah. that process? Um, especially with the reuse section. And part two, that picture, when things are being brought out to Um al Ghab, yeah. those don't really look broken. Yeah. I mean, except for being left yeah. for 3,000 years. Yeah. So in that case, yeah. they're just being put down and not recycled. Yeah, so these are two very important differences in the archaeological context. So if you are giving a votive offering of a pot with beer or incense, that offering is for the god and you leave it and you walk away for the, the festival. So if you have that small gobby, you have the incense, you have resin. There's been weirder things. There's been like little balls of sheep dung that have been rolled up and found. It's very complicated, weird stuff, but have been found and that are, that are left there. So that is for the god to consume. That's that. It's there. It's done. It doesn't re-enter the circulation. In the temple, what we're finding in these service areas and in the trash, so we're looking in the trash heaps by the service areas. These are whoopsies. These are things that have broken. These are something that came out of the circulation at some point because somebody had an accident. Um, so those pots, there's, there's really, if they came from the brewery, they went into the temple, they wouldn't have been given to the god probably in that ugly beer jar. Uh, what we see in, in terms of temple depiction are beautiful, just like you guys saw with that incense burner that was really nice and it was made out of metal. There's the same kind of things with pottery for temple ritual that were made out of metal that were made out of gold or stone vessels or things like that that would have been used for pouring out the libations. So inside the temple, it, beer would have been transferred from the ugly beer jar into the pretty thing for the god. But then the rest of the beer jars would have been given out to people, either in the jar form, because the jars are actually not that big. Like, they're, they're kind of manageable. They're like, I mean, this is a 10 centimeter, so that's like that big. You know, they're like that big. They're, 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 you can manage them. And then one of the great advantages about having the, the way the pots are thrown on the base, you still have the finger marks from the throwing. And so these finger marks are great because you can really grip them. And you can keep your hands in those grooves from the throwing process. And so it's, it's pretty easy to, to, to move them around. Um, so some of them would have been, you know, taken out. Or some of them would have been, some of the beer jars could have stayed there and those, those beers could have been poured into like an animal skin and taken on the back of the donkey and gone home. I mean, there's a lot of variation there that could have happened, but we don't have that much information. We don't have text where people explain this is what happened. It's not depicted on, on temple imagery. You don't have any art explaining this or showing what happened. So all we have is the archeological evidence, which is the garbage piles. So those are the ones that, that broke. And we also don't have breweries, so that doesn't help either. So it's, it's a bunch of speculation. But those are two important differences in terms of archaeological context. And it could, you know, and that's something that, that the kind of movement around of beer jars is something that also increases variability. Because you have probably different producers, you have beer jars coming and going, and it, so it's like a, like a taxi kind of depot service. So it is a difference. Also, we have some beer jars like this at Omal Gob, and we see them at other ritual sites that would have changed it. And that is a beer jar. That's an internal profile of a base. There's a weird thing about beer jars. Some of them have a hole poked in the base, made during, made during production. So this wasn't afterwards. This, it was made to have a hole. So in that case, maybe these jars are symbolic representations of beers that would have been left there and not actually filled with beer. So 
it kind of goes into that category. Because you, 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 you make it symbolic. That's how you make it just like an idea. It's like the same thing like a miniature pot. You, you have a miniature vessel that you put in your tomb that's a representative of a bigger thing. So it's, a, it's a, like, a, like an abstract concept. But this is, a, this is a, a big debate in terms of the beer jar world is why. Um, so it's, it m makes it not functional. Who would have thought beer jars and votive dishes were this complicated, huh? That's how I got a 700 page dissertation from this. <laughs> essentially 100 pots. <laughs> so yeah, but it is, it is a really good question and it's something that, that there just needs to be a lot more evidence and the way that we can find this is to have people do more detailed excavation of temples in, in recent times in the areas where there's trash deposits and dumps, not the glamorous areas. So this is something that Mary Ann Pools Wagner has done and so I can see from the context of the North Abydos beer jars, okay, this is what happened. So what I think in North Abydos is that that's a trash dump. So it was from the area and they were thrown away. And there's some food production spaces nearby. So maybe it's, it connects. Yeah. Are the, the, the banks of the mountain, are, or any of these, did you ever, did you compare the two? Were they basically a stack? Yeah. yeah, yeah, they could. They totally could stack. Like this is smaller than this, so you could stack them up. So yeah. I'm thinking that the, the whole, maybe this was some sort of filtration uh, system where there were different types of beer and different materials, and so the beer would be filtrated through one and carrying it into the other. So it's a, it's hmm. a mechanical process. Well, that's an interesting one. I mean, it seems that they were brewed in vats, and then from the vats they were poured into the beer jars. But there was a, a certain amount of gunk, I guess, in ancient beer. That's why in Mesopotamia they had those long straws that they drank out of. So, I mean, maybe this helped. So it's higher, it's top shelf than bottom shelf. Yeah, I mean, there's some pots that have, I kind of like this idea. So there's some pots that have strainers. So we do have ceramic strainers. So we do know that they have the ability to strain things. Um, but, hmm, maybe, I don't know. I have to think about that. Okay, we're gonna have to credit you. If I, if I ever publish anything about this, I'll be like, and <laughs> give you some credit there, because that is an interesting idea. I don't think anyone suggested that. Hmm, that's an interesting one. <laughs> okay, we have a lot of wisdom over here regarding this topic. <laughs> All right. Well, there's no more questions. Okay, thank you. Thank you.